With me right now is Robbie Carr Wells, campaigning to be president of the United States in the year 2016. Robbie Wells, thank you for being here. How are you doing today? Don, I'm doing just fine. Thank you for having me tonight. Glad to have you. So I'd like to start off by asking you who you are and a little bit about your personal life and how you got involved in politics. My name is Robbie Carr Wells. I am a resident of Charlotte, North Carolina, small business owner here in Charlotte. Most of my professional career has been in college athletics, coached college football for a number of years. My last coaching position was the head football coaching position at Savannah State University, which is a Division I historically black college, and I was the first white guy to ever do that. Served in the uh, Army National Guard as well. I am not a career politician. I, I consider myself to be a proven leader, and I, I have proven that several times now, and gone into situations where the program the programs were in shambles, and we were able to quickly turn things around, and we were going to take that same mentality to Washington come 2016. I'm not sure that we've had a lot of presidents that were proven leaders before they were presidents. <laughs> you know, you're, you're exactly right. In fact, if you look at President Obama, where he was before he was actually elected in 2008, there's a lot of people that would argue that I'm actually more qualified than he was when he actually got the job. There's not a lot of white guys that can claim to be coaches of all black or historically all black colleges. What was it like uh, coaching a school like that in terms of I don't know if cultural differences is the right word. I mean, there, there must be a different mindset to, to go into an, a, a coaching position where you might be the one white guy on the staff. Well, you know, Don, I've always looked at people as being people, and I've gone by what Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, let's not judge a man by the color of his skin, but by the content of his character. I was adopted, Don, when I was six weeks old by a Baptist minister and his wife. And when I was about 14 years old, my parents actually adopted another son, my brother, who is black. And so it, it's no big deal for me. People are people, and we've got to start putting aside all these petty differences, whether we be young or old, male or female, black or white, gay or straight, Democrat or Republican, constitutionalist or libertarian, Green Party or independent, whether you're a Christian or a Catholic, Mormon or a Muslim, atheist or agnostic. We all have differences in this country, but we can embrace those differences, Don because we have one common bond. We're all Americans. And we're all members of the greatest nation on the face of this planet. It sounds like it was a very positive experience for you. Well, it was. In fact, I, I coached at, at several historically black colleges. And even back in my early career, when I coached on the high school level, I've coached at schools that were mainly white. I've coached at schools that were mainly black. I've coached at schools that had a great mix. And it really does, does not matter. So did you see, as a child, what it was like to be both adopted and have a brother who would be of a different racial background than you? Did you see anything about the way others may have treated him or you? And did that teach you something about relationships? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and you know, I, I, will, I will just say this. We've got to get to the point, Don, in, in this country where we look past petty issues of not giving someone a chance simply because of the color of their skin or, or whatever the case may be. This is what I tell everybody that's actually on our team right now. And by the way, we've got representation in over 41 states now. But I tell everyone on our team, we will not turn anybody away because this campaign truly is going to be for the people of the United States of America, which is why I'm running. I am not running for fame or fortune or anything like that. I just as soon, if, if it was about that, just sit back here and, and uh, just run my little business. No, I'm running for the people. There's 20 million Americans that do not have jobs right now. There's another 25 million that are underemployed. We've got 39 million Americans living in poverty and 149 million Americans existing on low income. That's got to change. And that's why I'm taking a stand. Is, is it part of your strategy to get ahead of the game so that unlike other third-party candidates, when it comes to 2016, your name is already out there? It is. That's part of our political strategy is to get our name out as much as we possibly can between now and the 2016 general election. I believe that it's working like a charm. We were able in this election cycle to gain a little notoriety, and, and uh, I actually went down and spoke at Fall Fest in Tampa right before the RNC started. And then, of course, this past week went and spoke at the Music City Liberty Fest in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, we've got another Liberty Fest coming up this spring in Atlanta, and we're looking at, at dates and spots in Tulsa, Oklahoma, Denver, Colorado, San Diego, California, New York, New York, and Orlando, Florida. And they just keep popping up. We're also looking at a spot in Louisiana. What are some of the major issues that are really important to you? The top three issues uh, with my campaign would be to bring the troops home, 
and have a military presence around the world that is constitutional. And we can do that with our standing Navy. We need to become energy independent. We need to bring all the manufacturing jobs back to America. We've got a plan to do all that. Uh, do you have any issues that you think are just not off limits on what you would talk about, but just are non-issues? Listen, I'll, I'll talk about any issue, but when it comes to gay marriage, let me just say this, okay? Uh, we, as a people, right now, if you look at the Constitution, marriage is not in there. So we have to go to the Tenth Amendment. Marriage is a states' rights issue, which means that the President of the United States really doesn't have a dog in, in that fight anyway. He's got, he's supposed to support the governors of each state with whatever is going on in each state. I do not believe government should be in marriage. I want to see a much smaller government anyway, and I do not think that you pick and choose. One of the places we could get smaller really, really quick in government is to get government out of people's bedrooms and get them out of marriage. I'd like to see marriage between two people and their God or their church, and uh, let's just go from there. But we've got bigger issues with balancing the budget, eliminating the debt. And we've got we've got a lot of issues about putting people back to work. Let me throw some um, one-liners at you and get some word association. Federal Reserve. End it. Gold and silver. I believe that we should go back to the gold and silver standard. War on terror. There's no such thing. You either have a, a war against a sovereign nation or you do not. It's not an actual war. It's about like the war on drugs. Come on, give us a break. Well, I was going to ask you next, the war on drugs. <laughs> okay, decriminalize marijuana use. And, and what I mean by that is this. If you're under 21 and you're using marijuana, just like alcohol, yeah, you could probably get in trouble. Or if you're an adult and you're selling marijuana to kids on a playground, yeah, you could probably get in trouble for that, too. But the same issue would be for, for alcohol. I'd like to see it where uh, we dealt with more important issues than that because we're spending too much money on, on it right now. So what about abortion? I'm 100% pro-life. Can you look out into the ethos and grab some political figures and give us an idea of, of kind of who you aspire to be like or maybe who are some of your heroes in, in the political realm? Back in 92, there was a man named Ross Perot that ran for president as an independent, and he, he garnered almost 20% of the popular vote. I believe that Ross Perot was probably about 20 years ahead of his time. Ross Perot was a, was a man that I actually voted for in 92 and 96. When, when I look at, at uh, Mr. Perot, I see that, yes, it probably could be done. I look at his, his first time that he ran in 92, and, of course, he got out for a few months there and actually lost a lot of momentum because he probably had a really good chance of winning the White House had he not dropped out of the race for a few months. Of course, Dr. Paul, because he was constitutional on all his votes, Jimmy Carter. My father actually worked for Jimmy Carter when he was the governor of Georgia. Uh, my father sat on a committee that oversaw the special needs kids in the state of Georgia, and he worked hand-in-hand -hand with Jimmy Carter. I saw Jimmy Carter as a young kid. I saw him go on to be the president of the United States, and it just kind of stuck with me that one day I was going to be prepared, and I was going to do that. So here I am, and uh, I'm going after my lifelong goal. <laughs> is you for real? I mean, are you really running to be president? And I, I just say this because so many of these third-party candidates I've talked to end up telling me, you know, it's really about educating people. It's really about uh, spreading the message. And even Dr. Paul himself, in interviews all throughout 2012, began to devolve into conversations about, well, campaign for liberty. You know, it's, it's really about the movement. Bottom line, is you for real? I've never got into a race to come in second place. Second place to me is first loser. I am in this thing to win it. I've got people in 41 states right now that are working on this, this campaign. We've got coordinators in each quadrant of the state. I've got a press secretary that is up in Chicago, Illinois right now. I've even got a social media specialist that's in Pennsylvania. Our team is growing by leaps and bounds. I'm in this thing to win it. I'm not like just a regular third-party candidate or some independent. We're putting together a team to actually take the White House. And we're going after the 90 million people that chose to sit out this election just a few days ago. We're going after them, and we're also going to go after the independent voters. We're going after the third-party voters. We're going after the constitutional-minded folks, the liberty-minded folks. We're going after the left-wing and right-wing folks, because it's going to take both those wings for this eagle to soar all the way to Washington. How are you funded right now, and how can others donate to you, and how can they get involved? We're funded right now through a grassroots effort. If anyone would like to get involved with that, they can go to the campaign website, which is www.robbywells2016.com. That's R-O-B-B-Y-W-E-L-L-S-2016.com. Okay, is there anything you'd like to add as we close? 
for for everyone that is across this country. I want them to to look at me as being their adopted son. I am not in this for myself. I am standing up for my family. Don, I'm standing up for you and your family. I'm standing up for, for people from West Coast to East Coast, from the North to the South, and everyone in the Midwest as well. A lot of people say, are you standing up just for the 99%? No, I'm standing up for 100% of mm-hmm. the American citizens, and that's who we're, we're going after. But we're definitely going to target these 90 million folks that, that chose to sit out this election last week. It's very nice talking with you, um, Robbie, and I do hope that we'll have more conversations in the future. Anybody listening right now, go to RobbieWells2016.com. Thank you for being with us today, Robbie Wells. John, thank you. God bless you very much, and God bless the United States.